Welcome to Stories We Love. Stories We Love is about, you know, stories we love. It's about people who are doing good in the world. And I get to interview them and help you get a sense of how great there are so many things that are going on in the world and maybe give you some ideas about what will make your life better or what you could do to make the world more fun for you and more beautiful for you. What you can do in this case today, we're talking to someone who is going to help us with health and that's something that I'm really big into. So I love that. And I want to welcome Doug Kaufman. Doug is uh, a teacher who, or a, a man who has been teaching about fungus. <laughs> and while that sounds kind of funny, um, it's a really fascinating subject. And so, Doug, can you give me a little understanding of how you got to this place where you're sort of an advocate for antifungal mm. living? <laughs> no, listen, as you were introducing me, I thought, wow, that's crazy. I'll never forget 24 years ago when I started on television, the network that brought me in said, uh, you know, the managers were all sitting around uh, and they said, okay, Doug, welcome. Uh, what will you be talking about? And I said, well, I'm going to be talking about fungus and disease. They paused, you know, they looked around the room and they said, okay, tomorrow, what will you be talking about? And I said, fungus and disease. 24 consecutive years on the air talking about fungus. Doctors learn, Karen, this much about bacteria and this much about viruses, especially the last few years, and this much about mycology, the study of fungus. When I got back in Vietnam, I was trained as a nurse, as a hospital corpsman, and each hospital corpsman went to Vietnam with the Marine Corps, and we were their doctor out in the field. This was 1970 and 71, I was in Vietnam. And when I came home, to say I was having bizarre symptomatology is an understatement. I worked with Dr. Everett Hughes at USC Medical School, and I would ride up the elevator to the ninth floor unless there was somebody else on that elevator. I would almost hyperventilate after I came home from Vietnam. My heart would beat, I'd start sweating. Um, at my stomach, I had horrible stomach problems. I had every imaginable symptom. And we tend to think, well, okay, post-traumatic stress. You saw things a 20-year-old kid shouldn't have seen or exposure to Agent Orange, who, who knows? And it was Dr. Everett Hughes who said to me one day, you know, Doug, you, your symptoms are so strange, your dry mouth, heart beating, nervousness. Um, did you eat raw fish in Vietnam? And I says, matter of fact, I did a couple of times. Well, you have a parasite and that's behaving abnormally in your intestine and off gassing and so forth. So I, at those, in those days, Karen, we didn't have, hey Siri, you know, we had get a library card, <laughs> go to the library and check it out. I, I read, thank you so much, David. I got a uh, 1953 parasitology book and I opened it up. And one of the first chapters I looked at, I thought worms, flukes, you know, in my body. One of the first chapters I looked at was yeast and fungus can parasitize man. Now I had jungle rot all over my legs and my arms from being out in the field and being wet and miserable for a year. And I now know that's a mycobacterium, a yeast type bacteria. And I began to wonder if jungle rod had transdermally gotten through my skin and parasites were in my body, little yeast, you know, going crazy. Well, I would prove that in that book and in other books. I now have published 13 books on the subject. I published an article in Oncology News in 2014, myself and two physicians, on the commonality of fungus in cancer. And it would take them another seven years to publish, as you probably saw in Nature magazine here a few weeks ago, 35 different cancers, and they found fungus in all 35 of them. I have been an outspoken proponent that diabetes and autoimmune disease and Alzheimer's and cancer have a fungal etiology. Fungus causes them. So you can imagine in 50 years, it's all I've done. I can't change the oil on my car. I have no idea how to do that. So I sit, I'm not your typical guy. I sit and study uh, mycology books and I'm telling you the older ones are priceless. Fungus is an organism that unlike bacteria or viruses, off gases an invisible poison once inside our lungs, inside our brain, inside our hearts or our pancreas. And these invisible poisons induce cancer. We now know that. One of them is known to, five of them are suspect. 
And uh, and the the big question here, Karen, that your audience likely has, is prove it. And so I began studying that those two words. Did you know that it's inhumane to try new cancer drugs out on cancer patients? So we have to give cancers to laboratory bunnies or rats, animals. How do we give a bunny cancer? We take a mold called aspergillus mold. We mm. use those invisible poisons called mycotoxins. We infuse them into the animal over a year or two. We inoculate the animal and usually there's 500 animals and they all end up with cancer. And Karen, I'm thinking of the guy who goes home, the PhD at the hospital, who goes home, puts his arm around his wife and says, you're not going to believe, honey, but all 300 of those bunnies today, we accepted, they all got cancer. And she, of course, would say, well, how, how'd you give them cancer? I injected mold into them and they all got cancer. But the plot thickens. <clears throat> we injected different mold into mice and bunnies to give them Alzheimer's symptoms. We inject two different molds, streptozotocin and baflomycin, into mice or bunnies to give them diabetes. Others into bunnies to give them cardiac diseases. This is amazing. Are we getting those fungi inside our body? Make book on it. You're probably in the cleanest homes in America. You are inhaling penicillium mold or aspergillus mold or some of these alternaria molds. And once inside your lungs, being a very viscous tissue, it'll catch those spores. And those spores can then off-gas these poisons. And there are numerous studies, maybe a hundred of them, that say sometimes we call it lung cancer and it's lung fungus. The patient never has the advantage of getting that biopsy done. A doctor takes a biopsy, sends it to a cancer testing lab. You have lung cancer, let's start chemotherapy and you know the rest, you know how that story ends. But there was a study a few years ago, 2013, in a journal called Lung, where 26 patients diagnosed with lung cancer um, didn't have it. They began doing certain testing and looked for mold, and they found mold in all 26 of these, began these patients on drugs called antifungal drugs, and they all made it through. Mm. They're not lying, Karen. They just don't know. This is not taught in medical training. Why? Can I just tell you, you don't shoot the goose laying the golden egg. Antibiotics are the most common mycotoxin, fungal metabolite, that we humans from womb to tomb swallow. And they are definitely linked. Science has recorded this for decades. They are definitely linked to an increased risk of breast, colon, colorectal cancers, all cancers. Alcohol is the mycotoxin of brewer's yeast, and that alcohol is intimately linked with cancers and diabetes and other things. So I've looked at nutrition <clears throat> through different eyes than our brightest and best. I've looked at the disease process as though it may be induced by fungus. So down that road, it's been fascinating. Yeah, that is fascinating. One of the things you just said, you know, about antibiotics, one of my other guests who uh, just is going to air soon, or probably by the time this one airs, she will have aired, her name is Didi Pearsouse. And she said, she teaches uh, regenerative farming, regenerative mm -hmm. organic. And wow. she said glyphosate is an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. So people who are eating food that is not organic, that is grown in a conventional way, any fast food, any almost every almost all food, unless it's organic or regenerative or, or biodynamic, most of those uh, people are eating a tremendous amount of the glyphosate through their food, which is a toxin, but it's also an antibiotic. So that's why, because my friend, Gary, he <laughs> just sent me a thing today that said, uh, the World Health Organization releases a list of deadly fungi um, and then he also she sent me something that says fungus infections are rising and because I was telling, telling him about you fung and, and, um, and merit more attention from the drug researchers. And that's mm -hmm. from the, I think the Washington post or something. I don't know. Cause he just sent me like screenshots. Yeah. <laughs> cause I've been like, friends. I'm like, Gary, don't. Stop eating your oatmeal. You're great. You're great. You know? 
this is this is so fascinating to me, Karen, because literally when I came onto this 50 years ago, I was the biggest self espoused quack in America to think any, well, a little vaginal yeast, a little ringworm, a little dandruff is caused by fungus, jock itch, you know, that's what doctors believe. What if they're right to that end, but fungus easily gains access to our lungs and can cause pulmonary bleeding, hemorrhage, lungs, uh, but every tissue. You see fungi, collect in a little sack that they make to hide from macrophages. We call them phagocytes, gobbling them up. Remember in high school, we learned about those guys. What? And there's power in numbers. So they grow in a little sack like a tumor. And 100% of them are called tumors. And anti-cancer therapy is initiated. I've been screaming this from the mountaintops for decades, and I don't know why. But I saw the same things, Gary, good for him. What a brilliant, hi, Gary. What a brilliant guy Gary is. Um, every day now, doctors are sending me. The one I just told you about, a Nature magazine, a, a big university in Israel. Uh, fungus is found in all these cancer tumors. Of course it is. I've been shouting that for years. This one that was just in the Wall Street Journal and other journals yesterday, uh, <clears throat> that uh, COVID, all these COVID patients, post-mortem studies, are showing fungus growing in their bloodstream. That's what I was asking about the other day. I hadn't seen, yeah. I haven't seen that that article, but I was thinking, you know, because they were talking about how a lot of cancers are becoming more virul virulent and more, they're growing faster and stronger and bigger than they've ever grown before. And so I was wondering if either from COVID or from the vaccines, I wasn't sure because the article was talking about both that mm -hmm. I was reading. Whether the whether either COVID or the vaccine causes more fungus, I don't know, but yeah. that's an interesting question. And so you're saying that they're showing it with COVID patients or COVID vaccinated patients or both, or what are you seeing? Doug's hypotheses. <clears throat> As we age, fungus easily grabs hold of us because our white count begins diminishing and glutathione and all these good things in our body began diminishing, so we're more vulnerable to disease. The reason COVID especially attacked the elderly, of which I am one, uh, was because we were sitting ducks. If you've been on lots of antibiotics, if you have your glass of beer or glass of wine every night, if you're on medications, which everybody my age, except me, is, um, then that makes you more, I believe that people ended up with a virus, but underlying that virus was a very virulent fungus that was activated by some as yet unexplained virus. But they already, their immune system, fungus dips your immune system dramatically, especially as we age. And they were sitting ducks for a new virus floating around in the air. Um, and to make that more interesting, Karen, because I know Gary would like to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy. I don't know Gary. Um, He's so that, <laughs> he must be to make this more interesting uh, doug's hypotheses do you remember when the virologist from wuhan lab i kind of like these women you know they all went into a bat cave a couple of years ago bat guano bat stools bird stools are broken down by a fungus called histoplasma capsulatum. They release it with the stool. It breaks them down. Otherwise, the world would be filled with bird droppings, okay? Those virologists, you know, masked up, put their little booties and their hats on and went in the bat caves and actually took the bats back to their Wuhan laboratory. You can't walk in to dirt in a bat cave and avoid inhaling histoplasma capsulatum. It's a fungus. Okay. <laughs> this, the symptoms of histoplasmosis and COVID-19 are one and the same, but the incubation period of histoplasma capsulatum is two to 14 days, the exact incubation of COVID-19. I'm telling you, we hear of gain of function by those nasty people. They were in a lab looking at gain of function and and uh, shame on them for, you know, extrapolating DNA and converging it and so forth. Here's what our scientists don't know. Gary knows, but our scientists don't know this. And that is gain of function is analogous <clears throat> to genetic fusion. Gain of function is done in a laboratory under a hood, sterile environment. Let's take the DNA out of this and put some RNA here and so forth. You fuse genes. 
genetic fusion takes place when you and I are sleeping. Believe it or not, human DNA finds its way, fungal DNA finds its way into humans and vice versa. And once you have genetic fusion, a hybrid is born. A good looking DNA merges with a good looking DNA. They have a baby. And this is a hybrid, a brand new organism. And the symptoms you would see in this relationship would look precisely like a virus, but would behave like a fungus. And I'm telling you, I wrote that again today on my website and got huge numbers of people are fascinated with this. Well, how did I get COVID? Why did I get COVID? Why does Doug feel I'm a sitting duck for it? Because you had an underlying dormant fungal infection that was activated with the RNA from some virus. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, just what you were saying about um, how a lot of doctors are trained in bacteria, which is this big, and viruses that are this big, and fungus. I lived in Hawaii when I was 18. I sailed from California to Hawaii. And the man I sailed with, lovely man, physicist, brilliant surfer, poet, uh, <laughs> genius guy, but he um, <clears throat> he got me two little kittens and I loved them. And you know, I'm in a bathing suit because I'm living on a boat, right? So <laughs> I'm holding the kittens and I'm loving them and I'm just kissing them and everywhere. So um, I went to the doctor because I had this weird thing. And the doctor says, oh, you live in the bay. It's got to be um, staph. I said, I don't think it's staph. And he said, you, you gotta, it got to be staph. So he gave me antibiotics and you know, it made it worse. And I had ringworm. And I didn't know it. And so I went back to him and I said, I told you it wasn't staff. And he goes, you have ringworm. And I didn't know what ringworm was. And uh, he gave me whatever, and it, it eventually went away, but it was a really good, I learned a lot from that experience about, not about um, not trusting doctors, although that was part of it. <laughs> and I love doctors, I don't mean that. I just mean, I learned a lot about um, how beauty has to be internal, hmm. that you can't rely on something external because beauty has to come from inside. Mm -hmm. That was a big lesson for that. But so what you're saying that is so fascinating is, you know, that we can breathe it in. It could be in a sterile house. It could be, it could be in a hospital. It could be in a, in a hotel. How do we mitigate? <clears throat> so I feel like I, I never get sick. I, I got sick once for three days and that was it like in the last 12 or 14 years. Mm -hmm. And what I, I do something that I do, which I call, I eat paleo but you have a different way of doing it. And so what is your, like, what's your method? And that's not the only reason I don't get sick. It's because I'm really happy and I, I don't yep. get stressed and all that good stuff. Totally agree. Um, but um, what is the thing that you recommend for people so that if they're breathing in mold or if they're, and mold and fungus are the same thing, it's just a different, mm -hmm. right. a different class of this. They're, they're all fungi, right? Yep, they are. So what do you recommend? And I know it's all on your website. You have a website called knowthecause.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, but talk about it a little bit because it's so it's so interesting to me. And I love it. You know, I love what you're talking about. And you've experienced it. Here is, and it's okay to say I love a doctor, but I don't trust him. And I think many of us the past two years, I don't have a doctor. I'm 73. I don't have a doctor. Uh, why don't you, Doug? Well, you mean you've never had your prostate check? No. Um, wouldn't I have symptoms if I, you know, this, this whole cancer testing, we'll get into that one day, but there was a patient that saw a doctor I worked with after I got back from Vietnam. He was an artist for Disney. Great guy, lived in a home up over looking the beach out in Palos Verdes, California. And he had the worst, his, his nose would bleed, his sinuses, his eyes were bloodshot, and he was a brilliant guy. And we didn't know 50, 48 years ago about any of this, but I recommended that he get out of that home and go to Big Bear Lake, uh, rent an old cabin and stay up there. And he called Dr. Gottschalk, the guy I was working for, two days later and he said, can you hear me? They were friends. And Howard said, yeah, I can hear you. And he said, you sound great. He said, I have never felt this good in my life. Doug told me not to drink alcohol, but last night I had a glass of wine. Normally I would wake up sick as a dog. I'm fine. What we learned from this was when a person gets sick with a fungal infection, we call it a fungal infection. When a building like a hospital gets sick, we call it a nosocomial infection. Hospitals are notorious 
for fungal and bacterial infections. With mm -hmm. all respect to them, they're sick people exhaling every day in the hospital. That has something to do with it. When he went back five days later, when he went back, he called Howard again. Howard said, Doug, come in here. And I listened and he said, okay, I'm feeling horrible again. I've been back two days. It's his house. If you suspect that you're, and Mayo Clinic said in 1999, all chronic sinusitis, 96%, is fungus. And yet every doctor hands a back antibiotic and antibiotics fuel fungal infections or yeast infections. So it just doesn't make sense to me. Antibiotic stewardship, I have screamed from the mountaintop for 25 years, they're not gonna do it. Doctors pass out antibiotics and they probably do it wisely because following every doctor with an open mind is a lawyer who says, you didn't treat that infection, <laughs> you know where I'm going. Long and the short of this is if you suspect a fungal infection, and I mean, Karen, it could be a blepharospasm, an eye twitch, could be bowel disease, it could be breast cancer, it could be horrible arthritis or pain. If you suspect, and you should, a fungus, get out of that house. Go to an Airbnb somewhere high, 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 feet would probably be best, and see if after two or three days, you don't get up and go, holy cow, my range of motion, my headaches are gone. This is amazing. It's your house. It's your house. And what's fascinating, Karen, is the Bible refers to this. Leviticus uh, 1433, the Lord told Moses and Aaron, when you enter the land of Cain and all that, I'm giving you brothers, when you enter that land, but if I put a spreading mildew in a house in that land, and I started studying this, why not a butterfly? You know, why not a Coke can? If I put a spreading mildew, a fungus in a house in that land, you must have to go and tell the high priest. He'll order the house to be vacated. There are laws back in Leviticus in the Old Testament that call for if clothing was contaminated, you got to burn it. If the rocks near home were burnt orange or fuzzy or gray, you had to take them outside of the town, take the house down and, and tear it apart. I have had to tell <clears throat> hundreds of people. It's so sad, Doug, we built this home. Yes, it leaked one time, but we had no idea the kids would be sick, the dog would die, we'd have so many symptoms. You need to leave that home and you need to go somewhere where you're not sick because once you've inhaled that mold, it's living in your bloodstream via the, the lobes of the lung. Uh, it's going to, lungs are a very vascular tissue. It's going to be disseminated through your body. Now you have left breast cancer. Now you have right hip pain that they're suggesting a hip replacement. Now you're suicidally depressed. Now you have ringing in this ear. That's what fungus does. But the stereotypical patient would go to an ear doctor and a boom boom doctor and a lower back doctor and a skin doctor. And those doctors would do what? Prescribe, prescribe, prescribe. They don't have the basic knowledge and they know this. They're, you're right. I have dozens of doctor friends and they're wonderful. Oh, yeah. the, ones who are, the ones who are my friends believe in this. They're helping patients get better, which is very exciting. I've given many courses through my career. And mm. it's so rewarding, Karen, when you help someone who didn't know they were living in a moldy environment, who didn't know the antibiotics when they were three years old for ear infections would 30 years later cause them to become obese. But it's all documented. All this is documented. Isn't this fascinating? It's fascinating. So to, to go back to like, what are the things you recommend? Um, because there are foods that feed fungus and I don't, I generally don't eat any of those things. And especially since I met you, I became even more discerning. So like, I don't eat any grains because grains are a fungus. Mm -hmm. I don't eat peanuts. I haven't eaten peanuts in 15 years um, because they have aflatoxin on them, right? I'm impressed. Wow. Like, yeah, I have lots of friends who are doctors, and one of them said, "Don't eat peanuts; if they have this mold on them." Yeah. Like, oh, that's so weird. Okay, so then, um, and then now, um, yeah. So before that, I haven't, and then I don't, I don't eat dairy because. Let me ask you this: This is interesting. You know, like on cheese, they have a mold, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you, you say dairy is okay. Some dairy. Uh, I had a yogurt the other morning out in Austin, Texas, and it was uh, uh, goat yogurt without any added, you know, sugars and so forth. Um, yeah, I think butter is absolutely fine. Remember the OSE rule. Fungus thrives on carbohydrates. Those are foods that end in OSE, dextrose, sucrose, maltose, da-da-da. In the harder cheeses, 
very, very little uh, a dairy sugar, right? So okay. we, we tell people that butter and, but I don't recommend, the more I study, milk is a mucus producer, especially as we age. And the more I study, uh, North America, Canada and the US is the only country in the world that allows an estrogenic hormone, mimics human estrogen, be injected in all dairy cows. Why? Because they can get from this to this in seven months. Not only antibiotics, but they're using, a, it's called xerelinone. It's a very potent growth enhancer right. that in my humble opinion should not be used. The European Union said decades ago, when we started adding this to our meat, which then becomes our milk supply, um, the European Union said, we're not importing anything from the US or North America they're, because they're worried about this, this mycotoxin in our milk supply. Truth be known, uh, I'm like you and you, you made one error. Grains aren't fungus. Grains are often contaminated with fungus because of the sugar content of them. Right, but don't they feed fungus? That's what I meant. Yeah, you're probably, yeah. yeah. So I'm especially, sure. especially um, in hmm. times of drought or flooding, what have we gone through, you know, the past 20 years here in America or where we import grains. So I just, can we live without grains? You bet. When I put together the diets, so when my friend went up 50 years ago, 42 years ago into Big Bear Mountain, um, he was kind of following a diet I put, you know, be careful of grains, don't drink alcohol and so forth. After he got out of the mold that he was living in, he could eat it. And he loved um, Tony the Tiger. I forget the name of that cereal, but Tony the Tiger, he loved that cereal. And John, thank you. Frosted Flakes. I'm surrounded by brilliant people. Frosted <laughs> Yeah. He told, he, told Dr. <laughs> he told Dr. Godshock, I can eat. I ate a bowl of Frosted Flakes and I feel great. Then he went home and the same bowl had an adverse effect, but it wasn't the bowl of Frosted Flakes or the glass of wine or the beer. It was his home impregnated with this mold. In the case of viruses, we need to kill the virus, neutralize it. In the case of bacteria, we must kill the bacteria. I wish it were that easy with fungus. Fungus must be killed or stopped. We call it fungostatic, stop the fungus, or fungicidal, kill the fungus. That's what these drugs do. Right. And it must simultaneously be starved. What do fungus eat? Carbohydrates. So when you're eating grains, there's a double loaded barrel shotgun, right? Because you're not only eating the sugar, when you chew up, when you masticate, mm, all the saliva mixes with it, when you swallow it, it's glucose. Right. And so this just fungus loves this, number one. But number two, sometimes more in third world countries, but sometimes here in America, as a matter of fact, more often in America uh, than not, I believe our grains are contaminated with tiny, tiny amounts of these mycotoxins, specifically corn, well documented, right. specifically wheat, even whole wheat. So we have to be careful of grains. Well, Doug, without grains, will I get carbohydrates? Yeah. You know, you can have green apples and grapefruit and berries and things on my diet. Plus all vegetables are carb carbohydrates. I mean, broccoli has carbohydrates to it. Yeah, so and not only that, go a step further. They all have something called phenolic, P-H-E-N, phenolic compounds. Many of them are polyphenols. Mm -hmm. All phenolic compounds, all plants have, and they're all antifungal. Phenolic compounds are antifungal compounds Aww. that disallow a seed, a broccoli seed, you know, going in the ground, it will be devoured by bacteria and fungus if it doesn't have natural antimicrobial properties. It does. As it surfaces and the sun now hits and photosynthesis starts, huge antimicrobial properties to green leafy vegetables, foods that survive the germination process. So that's why if we're eating non you said something that I thought was so brilliant here. Earlier, you said, Doug, I just never get ill. I haven't been ill in, you know, maybe three days in 12, 13 years. And then you took a step out and you said, I've kind of been following a grain-free diet. I don't get into peanuts, and, you know. And no it, sugar. I don't eat any sugar. Right. I don't eat fruit juice. And yeah. may I say, Karen, it shows. I mean, it, it shocks me what we eat as a society. And why, it, it, look, bottom line is, it's working. 
we are running from doctors at rapid pace. Our hospitals are filled. Our disease table is full. We in America have figured out a way to manage your asthma, to manage your sore ears, to manage your sore back just as long as you keep coming in and paying me. I'll give you a little piece of paper and scribble on it if you take it to that pharmacist and exorbitantly pay a fee for the next two months till you go back to me. I'll feel your hip again, give you another piece of paper. If you'll take it back to that farm, you see, this is a hamster on a wheel. We're not getting better. We're managing disease and symptoms. So healthcare, I question that word. We're disease care. Exactly. America. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I have a lot of friends who are doctors. I love doctors. They're brilliant. They're really fun. They're, they've got so much wisdom. And yet I haven't gone to a doctor in a long time. I don't get mammograms. I don't get any investigations into my body yep. because I think I would have a symptom if I did. And I have no symptoms. I sleep better than I've ever slept. I, I think better than I've ever thought. I, you know, I'm healthier. I have more energy. I used to have narcolepsy. I used to have chronic depression. It's not just my diet. It's I, I, I actually cured all my stuff with being in a state of continuous love. And then the continuous love, even like the way I gave up sugar, I love sugar. And then I loved it. And I loved people so much that everybody was so sweet in my world that I couldn't eat sugar anymore. It was too, it was too heavy compared to the sweetness of life or the sweetness of the world or the sweetness of my connection with my with that source of love that I have right so it's so interesting to me like how we keep you know we keep looking for the, the here's the thing I think when you look for a problem you can find it and so when you go to a doctor you're looking for the problem but with every person who's alive there's more that's beneficial that's happening in their body or they wouldn't be alive if it overcame and it was too much of a problem they wouldn't they wouldn't exist but it's beneficial so are you saying okay so you're saying basically not, you don't encourage sugar you don't encourage grains what else I what don't do you you're right. um i don't encourage foods that feed fungus it's really that simple does a steak no and yet the entire american medical association says meat is killing people well if you put xerelinone in it and if you put antibiotics in it before you slay it, I concur with them 100%. Meat is dangerous, but there's two kinds of meat. There's meat that's grass-fed, grass-finished. Now we have farms with fish. Farms are supposed to be in lakes. And, and so we have fish that we're, that we're convincing the general public is just, it's tuna fish. We grew it in a, it's unbelievable what's happening to this once brilliant country. We have devised schemes. They're called genetically modified organisms. If I can, again, Karen, just drop back to this book that, that um, I read and read and read. In, in the opening book, uh, Genesis, the Lord says over and over and over again, with seed of like kind, I give you every green plant, I give you fruits on a vine with seed of like kind. What did man do? Oh, no, we're going to mince seeds together. Because we're worried about global feeding, or we're worried about the sprays on food. We're going to nonsense. What we're trying to do is franken food people. What's the end result of that? You and I get to observe it every day. All you got to do is pick up uh, the internet, pick up a newspaper, a magazine. We are sick. We are obese. We are depressed um, and because of what we're fueling our bodies with. We really get a choice. We all get a spoon at the beginning of life. You can eat the right foods, organic. My wife and I committed when the kids were little to organic foods. Yeah, that's all I eat. Right, organic foods, but you can also begin digging a hole in the dirt. And it will take you about 60 years to get that hole down to six foot deep. And then we die and they push you into that hole. It fascinates me. It, and the fungus is home. The fungus that lives on your body wants to go home. And so it's not shocking that we're dying at a young age, putting a box down in the dirt and the fungus escapes the box and goes home as it deteriorates your body. Fungi are either saprophytic, 
they uh, they eat dead or decaying material like our body when we die, or they're parasitic. And this is what doctors do not learn in their medical training. Like a worm, a nematode, a fungus can off gas a poison inside our body and can slowly poison us. Sometimes a year if we're older, sometimes a month if we've got a new virus that comes into our environment and we succumb. Sometimes if we're young and virulent and healthy, we can go 50 years with that antibiotic residue living in our body without getting devastatingly sick. Oh yeah, we see the doctor, we get our cancer screenings and so forth. I gotta tell you, there's two sides to this coin. And I'm a guy who watched mom and dad when I got back from Vietnam, they smoked. Uh, dad enjoyed his beer, mom enjoyed her glass. Of and, and then I remember dad especially lost a leg, he lost a hip, he had a pacemaker, he had prostate problems, going doctors all the time. And I remember saying, it's too bad. I hope I don't get old one day and have to go to doctors all the time. I am old. I don't have a doctor. I haven't had a physical exam. I don't know, by exit from the Navy, uh, 49, uh, 51 years ago was my last physical. Who needs a physical? A doctor needs a physical. A pharmacist needs a physical. A hospitals need physicals. But how do we benefit from them? Well, we're, cancer, we're catching cancer early. Teach people of the fungal role in cancer, now well documented, and you'll do much more than poking and prodding at their tissues, my opinion. Yeah, and that makes sense to me because, um, you know, when you are in state, so one of the things I do, I teach people how to uh, basically let go of old programming or PTSD, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, I teach people how to be in a state of consistent uh connection con consistent love consistent joy that's what guided me i didn't know i mean i had learned i i studied nutrition as a kid so i knew about sugar but i had never been able to quit it and then because i was in this state of love the sugar left and then because i was in this state of love i realized grains don't make me feel good so those went away and then because i was in a state of love i was drinking like a half a gallon of milk a day or every other day, I should say, every other day. I like milk, it has so much sugar. And mm -hmm. um, and so I gave that up. And so then I stopped eating dairy. I do eat butter, but dairy and ghee, I like ghee. But um, it's just so interesting because when you're in this state of alignment or, or love or connection, whatever you want to call it, you get guided in a way. And I think a lot of things, you know, I don't, I have a lot of compassion for doctors because they're trained to stay in their head. They're trained to stay more mental versus connecting from their heart. And I just I just think that that's so important. When you connect from your heart, you are guided in a way that makes it things make more sense. So when you say you don't, oh, first of all, when you talk about your friend who went up to the high mountains or you say go to a high place, what is it? Do fungus not live as well up high or what's the, what's Fun that? High. Fungi, by the way, are the only living organisms uh, at Chernobyl. Right. Decades later, they're they're growing and flourishing. They do. Um, fungi thrive in heat. So many people through the years have told me, Doug, why is it I get out of the shower and my towel? Oh, it just pull it to itch and itch and itch. Fun heat activates fungi. Fungi love heat, but they can grow in cold environments also. Um, so understand the higher you go, the less oxygen, a little bit more difficult for living organisms to thrive. So I always, and to this day, I tell people, where do you live? South Carolina. Well, get up to the mountains and spend one week up there and see how you feel. And I always tell them to, to highlight it. Take a little notebook. Got up there. I'm sick. I'm tired. We drove all day. I'm going to bed. Next day. Okay. I had a smoothie with carrots and green apples, like Doug said, blah, blah, blah. Uh, third or fourth day, this is amazing. Third or fourth day, I really feel good today. Jim and I went out for a walk. I did a little jog. Of it. And you read these, and I've read plenty of them. And it's amazing how it's not, it's, it's not their health that's bad. It's their house that's bad. <laughs> and I see this over and over and over again. And sometimes that house needs to be taken down. These people then can go on to what we call the Kaufman 2 diet, more fruits, uh, oatmeal, things of that sort with a little beta glucan in it and, and so forth. And, 
and uh, they thrive in that environment. People who are genuinely sick with rapid uh, proliferating diseases rarely back off our diet. They start feeling good and they don't. So killing fungus is different than killing bacteria or killing you know, other organisms like viruses. You got to kill it, but you got to starve it too. One of my girlfriends, uh, she's, she's gone, well, she's not gone, but she's transitioned out of her body. I mean, I still feel her. Mm -hmm. um, she turned on my lights for a while, right on the day, two years after she had passed to um, let me know that she's still here. She's done that. And she's done other things that let me know. But she, um, she was in the hospital and the first, and the, the IV that they were giving her, she had pancreatic cancer, or that's mm -hmm. what they, she was diagnosed with. And what they were giving her was um, gl glucose. It was like an IV. And I, I'm not sure if it was glucose, dextrose, sucrose. What, what was the, the first ingredient was water. The second ingredient was an OSE, either glucose, dextrose, sucrose. I'm not sure which one. And then a whole bunch of chemicals that I couldn't understand. And I remember saying to the nurse, I said, why are you giving her this? And, um, and she said, I don't know. It's just what the hospital orders. And I said, do you, do you realize? I said, all the food that you're giving her you're giving her grains, which cancer loves. You're giving her sugar, which cancer loves. You're giving her processed foods, which cancer loves. And you say that's what fungus loves. So I started to realize, gosh, I'm like, it's so fascinating to me. All the, you know, that what you're saying, it's what I knew about cancer. I've known this about cancer for years, that cancer loves sugar, grains, uh, dairy, you know. Alzheimer loves sugar, grains, dairy. Yep. yep. So, um, so people, if they do have some issue that seems like cancer, they should also say, let me get a fungal test. Like how do you, a fungus test or mycotoxin test or? Sure. There are laboratories now, mycology laboratories, and, and I referenced this earlier, let me expound on it. When they take that lump out of your breasts, they do a biopsy they send it off to a lab that's looking to diagnose or not breast cancer. Right. The laboratory would never do fungus testing on a cancer sample. Um, they need to be ordered to do it. You want a mycology panel. You want the majors, fusarium, penicillium, aspergillus. You want the majors tested and the mycotoxins. There's a laboratory owned by a guy, it was an old Navy guy like I many years ago, right here in Dallas, real-time labs and they do panels on cancer tumors on tissues on sinus secretions on sputum they they do panels on fungus they're fungus specialists i've lectured to their groups of doctors before fascinating thing i believe you're on the right track when you understand that statin drugs kill fungus i don't recommend them but statin drugs kill fungus so what runs our cholesterol and our triglycerides up if it's not fungus in our body. Did you know SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants kill fungus? Remember, you probably know this because you're a genius in this area. <clears throat> Two months ago, they admitted, well, serotonin depletion doesn't make depression. We don't know what does. Right. Well, your pills just happen to kill, oh, sorry about that. Your pills just happen to kill fungus. So the reason you're depressed is likely a neurological uh, neurotoxicity. Fungi, including penicillin, are known to be neurotoxic. Nobody gets that. I mean, nobody, fungus, the similarities between cancer and fungus. Well, this one, fungus grows in a sac so does this. Well, this one can live anaerobically without any oxygen. It gets bigger and bigger through the months. Cancer. Well, this one uh, liberates lactic acid, a poison. This one responds favorably to antifungal drugs. So do cancer tumors now. We got Lamisil, we got uh, Sporinox, we got Amphotericin B, we got so many antifungal drugs that are helping cancer patients. One has been repurposed. It's called itraconazole. Yeah, but this one uh, liberates volatile organic compounds. Dogs smell fungus in your home. Those same dogs can smell cancer in your body. I'm yeah. telling you, this is not, Karen, coincidental at all. We are overkilling, I believe. So, so 
um, some of the fungal feeding foods that I've read on your website that I didn't realize are things like balsamic vinegar. Um, <laughs> oh, well. vinegars, in, vinegars in general. Yeah, but you say uh, apple cider vinegar is okay, right? Apple cider is actually malic acid, which is a remedy. Funny story, Karen, when I used to work at the hospital out here, I talked the doctors into letting me, I was on our little radio show out here and lots of listeners and I wanted to give back to the community and the doctors are so awesome. And I said, every Tuesday, if they can get here, could I see these people for free? I bought these little tiny bottles of malic acid of apple cider vinegar and knowing they couldn't go to a pharmacy and afford anything else. I'd give them one of those and say, take a teaspoon of this, stir it in a glass of water, drink it a couple times a day, go off these foods, yada, yada. And it was very, very exciting. Apple cider vinegar, malic acid, that which makes green apples tart, uh, is very potently antifungal. Other vinegars, I just tell people, unless you're dissolving your toenail fungus, you know, to, uh, to stay away from. Uh, the diet was, yeah. Oh, you also said pistachios. Yeah, pistachio nuts. And guess what? Even worse. I don't know about you, but I used to drive along in my little van and I'd get a bag for five cents of sunflower seeds, mm, spit out the seed and you'd eat the little, or you'd swallow the seed and you'd spit out the shell. Sunflower seeds, pistachios, they've now found a lot of these molds growing in seeds that crack, peanuts that crack. So far, not bad on almonds, although I have seen some studies or walnuts or pecans, but <clears throat> and, and pumpkin nuts. seeds. Pumpkin seeds, I wouldn't think so. Great source of zinc, by the way, for men with prostate problems. Zinc kills fungus, so obviously it would work. Um, so no, I, I uh, through the years I learn more and I update the books with what I've learned. I'm a one man. Fifty years ago, Karen, it was so lonely out there. <laughs> you have to remember when I realized I had a fungal problem and mine was more of a yeast. Yeast is a single cell fungus that I had gotten into overseas. I was on a baseball team and we'd all go in after and shower and get dressed and so forth. And um, it, they, the guys would go out for a beer. And I started saying, no, nah, I, I don't feel too good when I drink beer. And I happened to tell our third baseman uh, that I had a yeast infection. I became the laughing stock of everybody. I'm the first guy with a yeast infection, right? Now we know that prostatitis, the most common yeast they have found in a male prostate is candida albicans. Hmm, that's vaginal yeast. Are we passing this back and forth in a loving relationship? The books that I have written uh, look into these theories. Medical doctors, most of them will say, no, you can't, intimacy can't give you a vaginal yeast infection unless, oh, they're, yeah. a woman, right? oh, okay. unless they're a woman. Then they'll say, yes, if it's a male, no. You know, we men can do nothing wrong. <laughs> so it, it, we're on the cusp. I got to live long enough at 73. I feel better than I did at 33. We got to live, I got to live long enough to see this come to fruition. The last month, four major pay, World Health Organization says 19 fungi are killing us. Really, COVID, they're finding fungus in all these COVID patients. Of course, they went to the hospital with fungus and were treated with antivirals go figure. It's, it's finally uh, coming home for me. All my studies of so many years, all the lectures, the papers, the books are paying off as slowly medicine realizes their antibiotics raise the bar of toxicity in we, the public, taking them. Right. And those antibiotics are, I believe, directly linked with uh, future diseases. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, Congratulations on trusting yourself, mm -hmm. because I know a lot of people get ridiculed for trusting themselves and going against the mainstream. And so bravo to you, because that kind of integrity of going with what you feel is right is so key. And it's not something that is honored as much as I would like it to be, because, you know, it's just so important. So I, I, I love that. And congratulations. Thank so. You. So I'm still wanting to get more clarity. And I know you have it on your website. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you can get, pe people can go to your know, knowthecause.com website, K-N-O-W, knowthecause.com website, and they can see some of the stuff. But let's just give people a little more understanding. So it's no sugar, no grains, 
no only only hard cheeses and butter of that kind uh, of yes uh, or goat yogurt uh, goat has a, a a protein called beta glucan which is an immune modulator and the yogurt of course lactobacillus acidophilus very good for the tummy replenishing the good bacteria that the antibiotics may have erased 20 years ago the diet says veggies are fine most yeast diets say no away from fruits totally and yet i found the green apples uh, malic acid, like apple cider vinegar, are okay. And berries are actually therapeutic and not too high in sugar. And grapefruit, as opposed to orange, is tart and has medicinal properties to it. So antifungal properties to it. So um, that's what my diet is in a nutshell. Can you eat chicken and meat and protein and eggs and nuts? Yeah, with the exception of, you said pistachios, sunflower. Uh, you know, I'm a little worried about these chocolate-covered nuts. You don't cover the nicest looking almonds with chocolate. You cover the ugly ones with chocolate. So I always worry my wife and I have a standing joke when we get cacao, you know, nuts. And I want to break one of those open and see if there's mold growing. In it. <laughs> exactly. Do you know, you know, the ketogenic diet and you must know Mark Sisson. You said the paleo diet. Uh, Mark is Mark would be great on your show, by the way. Mark is a dear friend of mine for many, many years. Well, it's funny. I've um, met him a couple of times. He's a good friend of my friend. I, I don't, I've only met him at like big parties, so we haven't yeah. talked a lot, but, yeah. um, but I've met him a couple of times and I knew his, his wife, I don't know if they're still married, but I, yeah. Uh, and they live now in Miami. Um, oh, wow. Just, oh, wow. just go up and say, Doug Kaufman says, hello, Mark. Uh, we made his uh, business very profitable when he was an advertiser on Know the Cause back some years ago. And we uh, have a friendship. What the paleo diet, um, what the carnivore diet. Carnivore diet says, I'm not getting carbohydrates at all. Right. Probably good if you have cancer, probably a good thing. The paleo diet, or not the paleo, paleo is a little more liberal. The uh, uh, keto diet, yeah, five to 10% carbohydrates. The Kaufman diet, remember I was working with Dr. Hughes at USC and I talked to nutritionists out there and they, oh no, you got to have grains or you'll die. Oh no, if you don't eat fruit, you'll die. I was young, impressionable, 23, 24 years old, trying to make a diet that wouldn't feed fungus. And I learned that was nonsense. So my diet would be the next step up from someone who can't follow the strictness of a ketogenic diet. Um, doctors are very concerned about the ketogenic diet because they're confusing the word ketogenic with ketoacidosis. You right. put yourself into ketosis, not diabetes, you know, with this diet. Hey, don't get me started. Right. But the long and the short of it is my diet, although I didn't know about those diets back then, my diet had the goal in mind of starving fungus while simultaneously providing great nutrition for the recipient. <clears throat> and that's what the Kaufman diet is. Vegetables are full bore. Remember, we talked about those poly. Uh, phenolic compounds in vegetables that have antifungal, antibacterial properties. Uh, so that's what the diet is. As far as snacks, uh, I'll have a hard-boiled egg or I have some cashew nuts over there in my office. Uh, beef sticks, they now make grass-fed, grass-finished beef sticks uh, that I just love. I'll eat a couple of those a day. So it's so different when I was young and sick. My diet was, I'll never forget Dr. Hughes asking me, well, what do you eat, Doug? I said, well, I, I drink Coors beer and, and I eat uh, Oreo cookies and I eat burritos and I like bologna, bologna sandwiches. And he said, well, you got to change your diet. A month later, I was miserable. And he said, did you change your diet? And I said, yes, now I drink Budweiser beer. <laughs> and so that, Karen, was really the start of this incredible learning process that continues to this day. Every day, something on fungus comes up. Even 10 years ago, shh, that Kaufman is a quack, fungus doesn't cause any problems, to now they're lost in it. They're gluttonous with information on fungus, and they haven't a clue. And I'm saying that respectfully. If you don't teach it, it's not the doctor's fault. Clinical mycology was purposefully withheld during medical training. I got to tell you, this goes back so many years. We know how sick a person can come when they get into candied albicans. Catheters in a hospital can kill you if it becomes systemic. We've known that 50 years, 60 years. 
why the hush up in medical training? I don't know. <clears throat> and why do you think it was hushed up? I mean, do you think, I mean, not, I mean, not, I'm not asking sure. you that, but like, as opposed to just them not being aware of it. Antibiotics so. were our first billion dollar drugs. Okay. You don't shoot the goose, in my opinion, I may be way off. You don't shoot the goose that's laying the golden egg. You don't teach 26 year old, brilliant, 170 IQ kids, 50 of them, to be careful with antibiotics. No, because there's a thousand of them in the pharmacy. You tell them all day, I want you to do this. Reach into your pocket and prescribe and prescribe and make it antibiotics. Yeah. Um, and we've over, we've overdone it grossly. Journal of Pediatrics, Journal of Internal Medicine, they're all saying what we need is antibiotic stewardship. Nobody's going to do that. What have we learned about the pharmaceutical industry during the past couple of years? It wasn't just the past couple of years. They want to sell wares. I suspect you're going to see vaccinations going through the roof for everything from, you know, stupidity to homeliness. They're not going to stop. They need more money. And that's my personal opinion. And I don't think it's going to stop. I think the goal is to prescribe, 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 and they're doing a great job. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because this is more relevant to me, maybe, but there, I think there are other people that have had this experience. When I was uh, fourth grade, they gave me tetracycline, a thousand milligrams a day, four pills I would take every day. And I took it for, yeah, for acne. And I took it for about 20 years. And, um, so it's a long time and yet i don't get candida infections anymore i don't have any problems anymore is it still something that's resident in my body is there something that i can do to shift it or somebody else who had a similar kind of uh, overdose if you will <laughs> of okay. that? right you did uh, tetracycline and the cyclines in general man immunofluorescence tetracycline and the cyclines but there comes a point in time at which you can overcome these mycotoxin poisonings. And that, it, it, again, not coincidental, I hope a lot of people are watching you because you're teaching the truth. What you've done by eliminating sugar, by being very cautious with your diet, by exercising and sweating, detoxifying your body, taking the right supplements, what you've overdone, what you've done is overcome the damage in the gut by taking those years and years, and I know this personally because I have family members who had done the same thing. They're now in their 70s and they're absolutely fine. You can overcome it. But if you choose a life of sickness and running to doctor to doctor and eating out of a package or a can or a box, um, and so often we don't choose that, but we decide for that, then you can bet you'll be seeing more doctors and your lifespan will begin to collapse as more medications and more medications are handed to you. By the time you're my age, you're usually on five to eight medications. Somebody's on 15 because I'm not on, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, but that's a good question. Can you, can you cure, can you overcome a deep seated fungal infections? There's two kinds. There's local like ringworm fungal infection. Then there's what I am trying to teach systemic mycosis where this stuff is in your bloodstream, in your sinuses, in your brain, uh, under your arms, in your lymph nodes, uh, all those tissues, every tissue in the human body, except the enamel of the teeth can be breached by fungi and their mycotoxins. So millions of people wondering why they have thyroid problems. Fungal mycotoxins are endocrine disruptors. Why do I have diabetes? Why do I have? Let me ask you a question then, because I used to have a thyroid imbalance and um, I have a functional medicine doctor and I love him. He's a, he's a friend now, but at the time um, he gave me something. And then because I got into that state of love, I didn't need the fun, the, and the thyroid thing. Mm -hmm. But then he said to me, if you don't take bioidentical hormones, you're going to get dry. Your, your, your skin is get bad. Your yep. hair is going to thin. Your brain's not going to work. But I didn't take them because I don't want to put them into the ocean. I don't want, you know, the creatures getting all these hormones from me anyway. So right. I didn't take them. I mean, I took them for a while and then I said, I don't want them anymore. But I tried them, but then I didn't take them and I haven't taken them. And I have the opposite. My skin has gotten better. My hair has gotten thicker. My eyesight has gotten better. My brain has gotten better and I'm juicy, not to be too. You know, whatever but i mean so like, I it seems to, right so it's like a, and so i'm thinking because maybe i don't 
eat, I just naturally with paleo, you say paleo is looser, but for me, I don't, I, I feel pretty clear. I just only eat like, you know, green, mostly green vegetables, sometimes sweet potatoes, uh, no grains, no dairy, everything, nothing processed, mm -hmm. everything that I either make or that is just, you know, I, I could, could make, like, I don't make yogurt, but I eat a coconut yogurt. It's so good. It's called the coconut cult and it, it's so good. And it's really high fat. Good. <laughs> I like a lot of fat, but healthy fat. Um, but what I was going to say is could letting the fungal foods go shift your physiology in terms of like, I didn't, I've never had, um, hot flash. I, maybe I've had like four hot flashes in my whole you know, yeah. adult life, yep. I don't get them. You know, it's just, I'm, a, I'm aware that I'm not menstruating anymore, but I don't get them. And so um, that's something curious to me. It, such <laughs> a good interview. Um, we have a saying in Texas where I live now, I'm from California, I live in Texas. When you find a good horse, you ride it. Even functional medicine doctors will say, well, if you're going off your T3, T4, TSH is upside down. You need medication. If you're going to go off and take bioidentical, and then as you go through menopause, take bio wild mixing, the amber tape, you know, uh, you, you will need those, as my books talk about, you will need those if you follow the acronym SAD, the standard American diet. Sad. Um, yeah, it is sad. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, the, the, the moniker. Is <laughs> right. Isn't that yeah. wild? Right. <laughs> you will need bioidentical. That's better, I think, than others. But here's even a functional medicine doctor saying, you got to take A or B. What doctors don't know is there's another option for a woman who stays away from sugar, doesn't drink a lot of milk, uh, eats the right fats, coconut and, and so forth, not the wrong fats. Um, you're living proof that what we say in Texas, when you find a good horse, you ride it, you find a good <laughs> horse without all the medicines. We're each a thumbprint. What I've learned after uh, seeing, working with various doctors and seeing thousands and thousands of their patients, what I've learned is to respect that we're each unique, right down to our thumbprint. So what works for you, and by the way, uh, my wife, exactly the same as you, exactly. And yet women are taught this menopause and these health problems are going to be horrible and you need a doctor and stick with your gynecologist and go on. What did we not learn from the Women's Health Initiative? That when they took estrogen and progesterone, they got heart disease. They got more cancer. We had them fooled for decades. Although according to that doctor that I went to, he said that's because they were testing with horse, with um, Pregnant. estrogen oh, yes. that came from horse urine. And yeah. we are not horse. So that's why he yeah. said bioidenticals are safe. So I'm not sure on that, but for well, sure. He's right. he's right. That's how they got the name Premarin. Pregnant mare urine became Premarin. The drug Nystatin for antifungal drug was discovered by two women, Dr. Hazen and Brown. They didn't get credit for it in 1948-49. And where did they discover it? In New York State. Oh, that's so great. Nystat in. That's how they used to name drugs. Now they're Ibumafam and what the world is going on? <laughs> the world of pharmaceutical drugs. Do you laugh at ads, drug ads on TV? I don't I watch just, TV. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, we don't watch the news now. I like HGTV and I like, I'm an old uh, car guy and I love the, the car channels, but the drug ads just blow me away. And this drug may give you cancer. So don't wait, get to your doctor right away and ask him what? It's right. Crazy. But you know, I think when I was, I, I'm an actor, I've been an actor since I was in my twenties. And at the beginning of being an actor, you could do a lot of, um, they could do alcohol, hard alcohol um, okay. ads then. And we could also do cigarette ads. I was offered 300 grand when I was in my twenties to do a Virginia Slim ads. I didn't even audition and they were offering it to me. And I said, I can't do it. And they said, why not? I said, it doesn't, I can't see how, I can't see how that will help anybody. It doesn't feel right. I can't do it. My agent was really mad. But what I'm saying is like, those were ads that were, that were available. I think soon we, if we can figure out how to do it, we get the, the pharmaceutical companies that they can't do ads on TV or in magazines, just like cigarettes, just like hard alcohol. Yep. So that that to me, because it's it's too flagrant, it's too much. You know, you don't want somebody who's not 
they had a lot of science to watch a commercial and say, oh yeah, and they're not listening to the fast thing because they say it really fast. You and then they say, doc, can you do this? And the doc says, sure, yeah, I'll try it. You know, like it's what not, it doesn't make sense because it's putting, it's, it's setting up a hunger for people in a way that's not healthy. I agree. And you're um, right. So I, I'm, I'm voting for, um, for limiting pharmaceutical ads in television and, and that. Yeah, yes, too. I mean, I don't even have a TV, so I, I don't see many of them, <laughs> but um, I'm on TV, but I don't have a TV. <laughs> right, exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so that's, that's so interesting because it is, it does feel like when you stop this stuff, your, your hormones get balanced. That's part of it. And, but the other thing I was going to say is we get cultural hypnotic suggestions and i've written about this in my in my books um and one of them is when you get older this is going to happen and when you get older this is going to happen and if you're a woman this is going to happen and if you're a man this is going to happen and you have to do this and and it, it's so many pro, so much programming and one of the things i think that's really important is to clear away these ideas that we have about age because i literally feel younger than i felt when i was young you know i mean i'm i'm younger when i was eight when i was 17 people would say how old are you and i'd say 84 that's how i felt and now i feel you know like seven my doctor said i had the physiology of a 17 year old the last time i went to him which was yep. seven years ago so <laughs> yeah, you're, you're following up with exactly you're you and i have much in common in that we have worked to make ourselves well so we can prevent not only illness but doctor visits um no harm no foul why would i go to a doctor i feel great and yet we're recommending these cancer screenings the one thing they're shaking their hand i get all these medical newsletters oh they're shaking their finger at women you're not getting a pap smear how do you, you're, you missed your mammograms? Did you happen to see, Karen, the article that came out last year that breast compression is causing DNA mutation in cells in the breast? I did and, see that. Okay, now this was fascinating because without this bit of data, it wouldn't make much sense. Ionizing radiation, which mammogram is, is not only compressing the breast and now we understand that it may be bursting cells and the DNA, but then we shoot ionizing radiation through it. I love the Turner Channel, the old movies. You go back to 1930, there's no obesity. Uh, there's no cancer. Women didn't have breast cancer until we had mammograms. I've got to wonder. I've just got to wonder. The PSA test. Did you know that the PSA test was approved by the FDA in the 1990s because the only thing we had on the market was a digital rectal exam a doctor does to a male that was 1% accurate at detecting prostate cancer. Along came the PSA, and it was 3% accurate. Oh, my God. It still is for detecting uh, prostate cancer. And yet it has been, in my opinion, absolutely abused. Men have suffered and died. Oh because my God. And there's so many men I know that don't have their prostates or they've been, yeah, it's just so wrong. And here, this is a terrible theory, but I think it makes sense. This is my theory. I think that if men, and this is totally inappropriate, but, but I think that if men could get consistent, and I know, I know gay men do this, so that's great. But if men could get consistent prostate massages and their prostate was happy, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go weird. I mean, I'm sure there's also the the candida and the and the other sure, yeah. fungal things, but I think that that's another thing. That's why, like, I <laughs> I massage my breasts all the time for the same reason. Like, I think my breasts are happy, and yeah. so it's. I think there's something about you know giving your body pleasure, yeah, in a way that feels good. It's going to start to just cause that part of your body to be happier an interesting hypothesis and one that why hasn't that ever been studied now we know the psa test is 3.9 percent accurate i'm a hundred percent guy not a three percent guy why do they continue doing that can i have a cash register ring ding, you know, ding. <laughs> it's just so frustrating to me 
Can I ask you about um, Alzheimer's? Talk to me about how you think the fungal um, issue is with Alzheimer's. Because there's, do you know that guy, Dr. Dale Bredesen? I've heard of Dale Bredesen. I don't know him. Yeah. Uh, but once again, I'll, here was a fascinating study. Uh, Dr. What is her name? Di uh, Diane Pisa. P-I-Z-A. Diane Pisa did this study in Spain. 21 cadavers in a hospital. We don't know what they died of, but they brought in pathologists to do the autopsy on them. And I would have loved Karen to have been in this room. After the autopsies were all done by these pathologists, what did you find? Well, in 20, or I'm sorry, of the 21, 11 had fungus in their brains and other tissues. The other 10 didn't. We don't know what they died of, but those 11 seem to have died of a fungal problem. The 11 were Alzheimer's patients. None of the other 10 that were free of fungus had uh, died of regular disease. I mean, wasn't that, is that not a home run? Do you not carry on that study in years to come? They have found fungus in Alzheimer's patients' bodies, in their blood. I was asked by uh, a medical journal to expound on that. And I did. I took time. I wrote documented scientifically on this, and then they refused it. I'll never know why. Maybe it was because I wasn't a doctor. I don't have any idea, but I believe Alzheimer's is the end result of unfortunate and unknown circumstances through the life of that patient. What do I mean by that? Peanuts, corn, alcohol, antibiotics, lots of them, medications. I think it's a culmination of. 60, 70 years of not understanding, and God bless their doctors, they don't understand, that when you put mycotoxins in your body via antibiotics or uh, you know, alcohol or impregnated grains, when you put those in your body, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer neurologically because those, like alcohol, is a neurotoxin. Don't believe me? Drink a six-pack and call me. Um, it, it, and antibiotics we know are neurotoxic. What does a lifetime of that neurotoxicity equal? Alzheimer's doesn't happen after drinking a six pack. Alzheimer's happens after years and years and years of a particular eating style. Might just be a peanut farmer in Georgia who ate way too many peanuts and it's now having its neurotoxic effect. Yeah, so that's so interesting because like the American Alzheimer's um, thing says, mm -hmm. you know, limit sugar. But grains are important, and we found that the Mediterranean diet, which is grains, yep, is 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 helpful. So, and and when when um, you go to a doctor who is supposed to be a dementia doctor, they give you a diet that is grains, yep, lots of different fruits, yep. lots of uh, milk and dairy, and yep. so. Um, Help. What yeah, what do I make of that? What do I make of that? How do you give a bunny Alzheimer's? You inject him with a mycotoxin, a fungal metabolite called ibotenic acid. And after inoculating for a few years, they all get Alzheimer's symptoms. Wouldn't it make sense that a 60s or 70s or 80 years old who had been inoculated slowly for acne with tetracycline? Uh, or for penicillin for inner ear infections, inoculated slowly over a long life, would end up on the south side of that life with neurological aberrations, with, with uh, problems. Either, you know, do you know some of these mycotoxins are called tremorogens? They induce tremors. What is Parkinson's? This right. is so deep that one guy can't possibly fulfill all the demands for this. I try, I have my my you know successful live show on social media my tv show has been wonderful been a hit i now do radio on weekends i'm trying before i die to squeeze my head of all this information and deposit it uh into people's lives so the next time they're doubled over with crohn's disease they say maybe that guy on the radio is right maybe i should try probiotics and l-glutamine and you know all these antifungal things on my gut to see if it works you're you've been drumming that you know beating that drum for years and years and that is diet if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you've always got 
Yeah. Is there anything else I should ask you that I haven't? Because I think this is really fascinating. I could probably talk to you for hours and hours. Oh, I do have a question. Yeah. This is a, here, this is, then you can tell me if there's something I need to ask you. So like when I'm talking to people who study uh, soil health, because soil health can sequester carbon, sequ can sequester water. And if it's got healthy things, it can sequester uh, or it can ameliorate methane. And then the more healthy your soil is, it soaks in, it doesn't flood, it creates uh if you start growing trees and bushes and it creates a low pressure zone and it brings in rain and you know so there's so much goodness in healthy soil but healthy soil part of the thing of healthy soil is mycorrhizal fungi mm -hmm. that's part of what they stretch out so if you have this the the roots of the of the plant the mycorrhizal fungi are underneath or around the roots and they're pulling in nutrients and the plant gives some of the polysaccharides to the mycorrhizal fungi how do you know is that gary how do you know that no no, no. gary no gary gary's a school psychologist no that uh, brilliant. <laughs> no that's that from uh dr elaine ingham and Dr. and Dr. and Dee Dee Pierce House and and also um, yeah Doc, it's Dr. Elaine Ingham she's one of my stories we love I interviewed her she's just out right now and she has a, a website called Soil Food Web and then Dee Dee Pierce House also teaches that and they actually work together and she has a thing called Land and Leadership Initiative and she has another thing called Rehydrate California. And both of them are talking about soil health. And so these mycorrhizal fungi are part of their conversation. And because I love this stuff, I'm so fascinated. But so those are fungi that are important for the mm -hmm. plant to live. Mm -hmm. yep. And they're also fungi that will degrade, you know, the they're in the compost. Like when you're making compost, that's part of the nematodes. The, yep. the fungi are going to uh, degrade the compost and they degrade, you know, the leaves the fungi are the thing, the fungi and the bacteria, are the things that degrade the leaves that are on the ground uh, to make them healthier soil, right? Yep. So I just was wondering, like, like not, are all there. fungi bad? Because those seem like they're good fungi. So the medical community will tell you that penicillin is the most important invention. It was a serendipitous. It was a mistake right. discovery. But when you think about it, Karen, it really was if it was used judiciously. We have pathogenic fungi and we have non-pathogenic user-friendly fungi. Mycorrhizal are user-friendly and they provide tremendous nutrition to the soil, the roots of plants and so forth. But if you were to cut that mycorrhizal out and chew it up, nothing would occur. But if you take the penicillin, the mold is penicill penicillium. The poison it makes is called penicillin. Isn't that interesting? Now, it has to be a poison to kill tiny bacteria in tiny doses. It's when we go for 20 years with acne medicines that it no longer makes sense. I'm for non-pathogenic molds. Uh, and there are many. Kombucha is made with a starter that is non-pathogenic. Uh, it's made with a bacterial starter. I'm into bacterial fermentation. I'm not so much into yeast fermentation. Because On your website, it said that the kombucha is made with yeast. Right. And you don't, I don't allow kombucha on, the, on but they're non-pathogenic. Okay. Uh, kombucha, everyone who drinks kombucha gets a little bit of alcohol. It ferments in alcohol. Right. And so I'm, you know, I, I don't want that, especially when someone's trying to go off that. Very much a mycorrhizal pro. I mean, very for it because of what it does under the soil. Fungi live under the soil and very often pathogenic fungi live under the soil. I think the mycorrhizae a mycorrhizal uh, yeast and, and uh, formations prevent many of these pathogenic organisms from damaging us when they grow into the fruits. Yeah, and so with you, when you're talking about um, be beneficial fungi, let's say, because there are things like lion's mate or reishi or uh, mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Are they are those kind of um, myco supplements right okay that's really good question and i'll answer that this way seven eight years ago i gave a continuing medical education course with a lot of other doctors to a group of oncologists uh they were integrative they were looking for things other than chemotherapy you'd have loved it there it was in san diego after my lecture i had a line of doctors out the door wanting to ask questions Two Japanese doctors had a female interpreter. 
they were OBGYNs in Japan. And I had referenced a study that said <clears throat> in 1977, uh, a doctor had a lot of women with chronic vaginal yeast infections. He took a hundred of those women and did stool samples on them regularly. And a hundred other women without yeast infections did stool samples on them. This is why this was such an impactful thing. And I'll get back to the Japanese doctors. He discovered that 100% of the women with stool yeast had chronic vaginal yeast. And until you cured this, you couldn't cure the other. Whereas none of the women with chronic yeast had yeast in their stool. So he hypothesized in 1977 that nystatin taken for gut yeast was a good thing. Uh, I now bring you these two doctors. They said to me, we have uh, women who for decades have had chronic vaginal yeast. And now many of these women have uh, endometrial or the endometriosis, or they have uh, internal cancers, ovarian cancer, et cetera. Do you suppose the yeast that they've had chronically could have converted uh, into a cancer? And I, all this was through an interpreter. And I said, I not only suppose, and I was showing them that how yeast fermentation can take place and induce lumps quite possibly, you know, in, in all these women. And then one of them said, but they're doing so well on reishi and maitake mushroom. Okay, that was the clue I needed. On the air flight back home from San Diego to Dallas, I sat in that chair puzzled. And let me tell you what I, what I surmised. If fungus is the etiology of your, you fill in the blank, my eye twitch, my headaches, my depression, my yeast problems, if it is fungus, then the rules that govern homeopathy say like heals like. Mayataki, reishi, mushrooms, lion's mane will treat a fungal infection inside the body. This is why I think so many people get better. I have read reports for decades on PubMed and in medical journals about therapeutic mushrooms working for so many cancers, and I could never understand it. But I think they're basing all of that on the laws that govern homeopathy, like heals like. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, and maybe there's also some fungi are aerobic and some fu fungi are anaerobic. I don't know if that's true, but that makes me curious. Fungi generally live in an anaerobic environment. They thrive just like a cancer tumor thrives in an, I'm sorry, in an aerobic no, without oxygen, anaerobic. They thrive without oxygen. I mean, it's. Uh, I sit on airplanes. Back, I stopped touring in 2018. My last lecture. I just got old. I wanted to be with the grandkids now and so forth. Uh, but I look back at the taps on my shoulders through the years. Hey, what about this? And. I'm a loner. I, I'm the only guy for 50 years. And now all of a sudden, 25 years ago, there's numerous websites that are saying, hey, try my antifungal diet, or here's something that's antifungal. And I am so thrilled for all of the new partners in this. I was the first quack to get into this, and I'll probably be the oldest one in it. Uh, but I, I'm still really convinced fungus induces every autoimmune disease and non-autoimmune disease known to man. So would you say, in terms of what you're saying, that if you have any kind of infections or, or uh, issues, you should not take those kind of mushrooms at all, any mushrooms, or you're saying maybe take a minute amount, take half a capsule or something mm -hmm. instead of I see mushrooms, and I never asked these Japanese doctors, but they impact my life. I see mushrooms as being one therapeutic option that should be offered. First of all, let me back up. The paper that came out a few weeks ago, it the onus should be on oncologists, every one of them, to try and discover fungus from a tumor, a lump, from the blood, et cetera, because they're finding in all these cancers fungus. So I think that's first. Second, I know what patients want and I know what doctors want. Patients want non-toxic therapies. Could mushroom be one of them? Mm -hmm. 
it could. Could caprylic acid from coconut or lauric acid from coconut or omega-3 fatty acids, they're antifungal also, fish oils, could they be cancer therapies? Yep. And I think you will see a shift because doctors learned, plug them into a poison that the nurse has to be double gloved and masked. Who wouldn't question that? Um, I think the public is going to begin driving medical care or it's going to disappear. I think the goal of the medical associations is to let pharmacists take over. They're already trained and given shots and given pills. Why do we need doctors? I mean, that's the attitude I see out there right now, and it scares me. But I think the second we listen to patients, we shut this and we open these and we listen to patients and hear what their desires are with this lump in your breast, I think we're going to win. Because right now you hit the nail on the head when you were describing doctors. Um, they have a standard of code they have to follow. What they don't understand is the standards are often derived at by people who are getting money from the pharmaceutical industry. Just like in California, we just passed a law, I didn't vote for it, where any doctor who veers away from the consensus. Yeah, I know. This de-licensed. De Unbelievable. It, that doesn't make any sense because that's saying that there's a governmental person who has not studied medicine, yep. doesn't have his own intuition, who doesn't know that patient, mm -hmm. has rights more than the doctor who's with the patient. So it's really an interesting time. Could um, he have a conflict? Could he have 90,000 shares of Pfizer? Of course right. he can. You know, or, well, just, or just be given, you know, uh, lobbying well. support. There's yeah. more, there are more drug lobbyists then there are people in government in the you know in the house of representatives yeah, no. and, in, and in the senate there's more all the more reason this is what you and i do <laughs> all the more reason folks as you listen to this to say i am important i do matter and i have the brain that god gave me to figure out how to keep myself well you've just heard you want to eat potato chips and you know canned soups the rest of your life okay that may have be a problem you want to eat healthy organic food uh, that may lessen your problem there are the exercise i'm telling you the right supplements you're talking about good fats i mean this is what you do karen and thank you for uh, you know being there so many years and beating that drum with people like me yeah and i think part of the biggest nutrition that people miss is also the mental thought and the emotional sensation, because that's so key to take care of. That's part of, that's a huge part of what I do is, uh, you know, just to help people get thoughts that are more guided by their spirit versus being in a place where they're just yep. having that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's all a combination, at least for me, but I do agree, exercise, sunlight, getting out in the sun. There's so mean. many things you need to do. Yep. And especially if like fungus is, is uh, this is going to be controversial, especially if fungus is, um, you know, anaerobic, you know, they have all these people, somebody just asked me, what about um, giving sun to your prostate or, you know, to your vagina? And, and to me, it makes sense that you would do that if, you know, if you have a place where it's private, not out in public, but if you have yes. a place where you could actually get some sun, because the sun is going to be, you know, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. So, it's, it's, you know, it's funny you ask that because I have this area in my backyard near all the trees in the pool where I take my shirt off now as an old guy and wear shorts and do my maxi climber and do my exercise outside. You know, the neighbors see me, they probably start crying. So I find this hidden place and people with a condo can do this and so forth. Um, but we always say, you know, I'm going to get you where the sun don't shine. Why isn't the sun there? You know, I expose yourself to sunlight as often as you can. You know, you wouldn't hold a match till it burns down and burn your finger. So don't lay out in the sun for a half hour in bright sun, but right. use your heads and expose yourself to sunlight. Yeah, I mean, I go out many, many times a day. I don't stay out for a long time. Yep. I, if, if, I, if, I, if I can, I live on, a, I live on a top of a, a canyon in Laurel Canyon. And if I can, oh. my balcony is far, I don't think, anybody can figure out my timing to use binoculars or thing. And it's only like potential helicopters maybe, but I, I go inside when I hear them. 
<laughs> but so like, I mean, I just go out there and I just get as much light as I can on my body as many times throughout the day. So I'm getting all the different frequencies. You were talking about uh, being on touch cycling. I am from Manhattan Beach. I used to surf all the time in Manhattan Beach. And I mean, my nose would peel and bleed in my face. And I then years later put zinc oxide. But here I am as an old guy now without knock on wood, you know, without cancers, I'm healthy. And I think lifestyle contributes to that sweating, cleansing, uh, do, cleansing the inside of your body with good probiotics, good fats, et cetera. Everything we're talking about, we're, uh, we're very fortunate. I am very fortunate to have gotten to my age, which I never thought I would be, and to feel this good, much better than I did at 33. So I'm encouraging people to know, I, you know, the three worst words, people used to tell me, Doug, I heard the worst three words. Oh no, you have cancer. No, my doctor says, <laughs> you know, the worst three words. My doctor <laughs> Um, you, just, you just have to be careful, folks. Let your doctor properly diagnose it. And then you assist him or her in treating it. Uh, that's what I tell people. I love it. I love it. You're brilliant. I love, again, your integrity of sticking with something, even though you were the quack, you know, yeah. because it's so important. I mean, I, I think with my thing about love, that love can heal so many things. People think, yeah, right, can't heal this, can't heal that. But I think I'm just sticking with it because to me, it's been miraculous and it guides me and it gives me this power to uh, make good choices. So I, I think it's so important. And, and, I, and I just, I love the integrity that you have and I love the way your mind works and I love how you, look at things and you're open but you're also really paying attention and looking at it and i love also how you are you know wanting people to find things because if people don't have the money to go to the doctor they can do something like this right away start shifting things and they don't have to be um you know beholden to the pharmaceutical um groups who I'm sure that they have initially met well, because, you know, it's so good if you see something and you see a benefit. I know when I took the tetracycline the first time, I was like, oh my God, my skin is so much better. But then it didn't work for a while. And I kept telling the doctor it didn't work. So he kept giving me more, um, you know, like, it's just so funny. But I just think it's so important what you're doing. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate your wisdom, your know-how, how prolific you are with sharing and with being out in the world, you know, you have hundreds of millions of watchers, you know, and that is fantastic. So I just want your message to get out. I think it's brilliant and I appreciate you so much. People can go to your website and it's called Know the Cause, K N O W, the cause, C A U S E dot com. And there you're also on Facebook, know the cause dot com at Facebook. And I also want to thank a guy. I don't even know him. He just is the one who told me about you, like, four weeks ago, I think his name is, um, his last name is Atwood. And um, I think it's Paul Atwood, but I might be a little bit wrong. But thank you for just telling me about you. Because he said, I, I was saying a post about food. And he said, Oh, you, you and Doug Kaufman. Doug Kaufman knows that too. And I was like, who's Doug Kaufman? You know, <laughs> so, like, so I really, I really appreciate you. Thank you so thank much. You. And thank, thank you, everybody. You. Yeah. And thank you everybody for tuning in to stories we love again. My, oh, I never said my name is Karen Laurie. And um, this again is Doug Kaufman. And you can go to stories we love dot, stories we love show.com and get all the episodes. It's also on YouTube and on tons of other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else you want to say before we say goodbye? Because I just love you. Yes, I would uh, like to give a special shout out to Gary. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Gary. I really we like grew it. Up together. Um, he's my brother's best friend. He's one of my oh. best friends. And so uh, he will love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>